Nigel Nunn is from Australia. He gets the prize for coming the greatest distance, certainly, for this symposium. He grew up in Sydney. He first read the Urantia papers in, starting in 1980, at age 19. He was deeply impressed by their description of personality and ultimata. Intrigued by the implications about interaction between things finite and absolute, decided that ultimatons were worth a deeper study. So completed undergraduate degree at the Australian National University in mathematics and astrophysics. He did one year postgraduate work on accretion disk around black holes, then sidestepped academic career to allow independent study of automatic physics, which begins us, which brings us to this matter of exploding dark islands. Thanks, Ralph. Exploding dark islands. Well, good morning, everyone. For those that didn't see Ralph on, on the audience, if you didn't see Ralph's talk last night, it was all about nano machines and what nano machines can do. And after your talk, Ralph, I had a dream about nano machines, terrible giant nano machines, <laughs> sliding down my neurons at 300 paces a second, or a minute. That, that was extraordinary stuff. Mm. All right, well, we're going to talk about, shortly, exploding dark islands. Uh, but I think before we do, I should just explain my, my motivation and what, I'm, what I've been up to. As Ralph mentioned, when I first read these papers, the two things which really stood out for me as being truly new, as in re revelatory, was their complete redefinition of the concept of personality. The complete redefinition of the concept of personality. That and how all of mass and matter is made from ultimatons. So this new stuff. And uh, so I thought that these are the two things I really need to study at, at some depth. Uh, and as I mentioned last night, a way to really learn about something is to try to explain it to someone else. So what I decided to do was to try to make two entertaining but non-trivial, you know, worthwhile introductions to personality and to ultimatons. So those of you that have seen my three little YouTube videos, uh, Sangeek 7, he says, search for Sangeek 7, that's me, and there's three videos about personality. Uh, so that's that done, but I promise I get back to the more cosmological things. And thus we come to these exploding dark islands. Uh, one last thing, we're trying to play this through the web via China and the moon and back to here instead of plugging it into the TV. Uh, and I've got a very high res video. And so this, there might be some choppiness or lag as we're trying to send this around the world back to the screen. So if that is, it seems to be playing okay for now. So all right, let's just dive in. It's a, a pre-recorded PowerPoint, so I'll try to keep the narration synchronized with that. All right, so be gentle. Here we go. <laughs> Exploring the connection between segregata, ultimata, and gravitas, surprising big bang. Now look, for those who don't not familiar with these Urantia book terms, run away. Okay, uh, hopefully over the next 40 minutes or so, these terms will become not only familiar, but intriguing. Now, uh, speaking of familiar things, here's a snapshot of those two so-called standard models that scientists currently use. One for particle physics, one for cosmology. Now, with regard to physics, the question we're exploring this weekend is, does this Urantia book... Does it offer anything, anything at all, that could help to explain or even to extend these standard models that native science has evolved? Uh, so in this session, what I'd like to do is not to present a finished statement or a model for peer review. What I'd like to do is simply to show how neatly certain parts of the Urantia book story fit in with what scientists currently believe, this stuff. Okay, so what's all this about exploding dark islands? Uh, to an astrophysicist, the Urantia book implies something outrageous, that what we call a black hole can explode. Now the problem here is that for a, a, a stellar mass black hole to explode, we need two things. We need some complete new foundations for particle physics, 
and some fresh ideas about space and time. As we'll see, this Urantia book appears to provide both. OK, so here's the plan. We'll begin with a quick review of the Urantia book's unique foundation for physics. And then we'll see what these foundations mean for mass and matter. Uh, and with this background in place, we'll take a fresh look at the most extreme type of the Urantia book Dark Island, a so-called black hole in space. And we'll see how they might explode. Uh, finally, like the next chapter, uh, some surprising implications of all this for our ancient super-universe, or Avonton. As we work through all of this, uh, keep in mind those limitations of revelation. Uh, paper 100, section 4, as the revelators explain, they were constrained by what we might call a prime directive. Things which we can discover for ourselves, we must discover for ourselves. But what about things that human science can never prove? like Planck scale interactions and the global shape of space, if something is not discoverable, do those limitations apply? So hold that thought. Let's begin with these foundations. Now, a good way to get a feel for your answer book physics is with a, a standard spiral galaxy. For example, here's the famous silver dollar, a galaxy of 100 billion stars about 10 million light years away. So when we look at such a thing with electromagnetic telescopes, we see something like this, a flat disk of stars, here seen, they're not quite edge on, they're very flat. Uh, but this visible galaxy, this tiny spiral of electromagnetically bright stuff, is what the Arantia book calls gravita, standard model stuff like atoms and photons. But the Arantia book <coughs> adds a few things to this picture, it introduces force organizers who spin up vast cyclones of segregata, condensed from absoluta. Uh, and as the story goes, it's within these isolated islands of segregata that so-called associate force organizers evolve halos of ultimata, from which power directors arrange this gravita, the standard model stuff from which stars and galaxies are made. Uh, so here we see how these Durantia <coughs> terms fit in together. Gravita is built from ultimata. Ultimata evolves from segregata, and segregata condenses out of absoluta. Now, a couple of things to note. Getting technical now. Segregata <coughs> is described as a primordial force charge, condensed from a global potential. In modern terms, we call this a Higgs-type field, or condensative charge. And second, in the Arantia book story, Ultimata is the foundation for mass. It's all mass, both the absolute and interactive linear kind. So a halo of ultimata is going to be massive. But ultimata is also pre-electronic. So this, uh, this halo has no electric charge. So no electromagnetic charge means no photons, no electromagnetic radiation. So this halo is dark. What we have here is a tiny spiral of fluffy stars embedded in a vast halo of dark mass. Exactly what our standard models of cosmology need and now assume, but can't yet explain. So this simple picture, in this picture we find the foundation of standard model physics. Ultimata serving as the dark mass required by cosmology, and segregata serving as that condensative charge or Higgs type field that allows particle physics to work. So while this is what astronomers currently observe, something more like this is what a solitary messenger might see as they pass by. Now, one more thing. Uh, in papers 41 and 42, they write that uh, particles of light move through open space as fuselage or little bullets, straight lines. But when plowing through these cyclones of segregata, or primordial charge, their path through space starts to wiggle. As we'll see, in the Arantia book story, segregata serves as a medium in which particles of light appear to wave. A medium in which particles of light appear to wave. Okay, I won't mention redshift, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> okay, so that's a quick look at the unique foundations on which the Arantia book scientific story sits. Let's see what this means for mass and matter. <clears throat> As you know, everyday stuff is made from molecules. Molecules are built from atoms. Atoms are complex things built from tiny parts. These tiny parts are called leptons and quarks, which are thought to be elementary. 
That is to say, not made from smaller parts. Scientists call the scheme the standard model, and it describes most things we see really well. But in particle physics, all this is thought of as low energy stuff, which implies another high energy domain, which is where the Urantia book comes in. The Urantia book approaches this standard model from the other high energy side, introducing those ancestral levels of not quite finite stuff. So in the middle here, between what we can measure and what's been revealed, we have this region of interest. It's interesting to scientists, they want to know more about leptons and quarks. It's interesting to your book readers, we want to know how ultimatons fit in. Okay, so what do we know? We know that for the standard model to work as advertised, this region of interest needs to be filled with a condensated charge. What's a condensate? What kind of charge? We'll get to that. But first, let's introduce the ultimaton. <coughs> Drum roll. <coughs> yeah. think, think how cloud, rain clouds can seem to condense out of thin air, and how drops of rain can condense inside these clouds. Well, if we think of the cloud as segregata, then the drop would be the ultimaton. So how do you imagine such a barely finite thing? Uh, think of a tiny vortex in this not quite finite stuff then this tip becomes discrete, a quantum of superfluid spin, an automaton. Right. The idea is that segregata can be condensed into ultimata, or as Lisa Randall might say, sequestered onto our measurable manifold. But before these ultimatons can be put to work, they need to huddle. Now by huddling, I imagine something like this. We've got two or three ultimatons locked very, very tight. Mathematically, we've got something like this, a balance of forces. Mutual attraction draws a few ultimatons together, while some extreme repulsion keeps them apart. It's this sort of balance between mutual attraction and extreme repulsion that explains the ultimaton's proclivity to huddle, mentioned in paper 42. Now, by the way, it's this extreme repulsion, ultimatonic exclusion principle, if you like, that's going to allow a dark island to explode. More on that shortly. I think I can take a break in a second. It's these two characteristics of ultimatons. They're quantized superfluid spin and their proclivity to huddle that allow us to make contact with the standard model. Because what's going on here is we're binding absonite energies into finite angular momentum. And angular momentum is something that science can measure. Okay, <laughs> this, this region of interest will contain not isolated ultimatons, but it'll contain clusters of, our, clusters of them huddling. So for me, this is where the Abanchi book story of matter begins, with a condensate of charge driving the standard model and a condensate of ultimatons huddling. Now the thing to note here is that this standard model requires, or it depends on an interaction between these leptons and quarks in this state of charge. This is the Higgs mechanism. Uh, and this is where this interactive mass comes from. This is now the core of the mainstream. So uh, to allow us to hook up the Arantia book's ultimate tonic scheme with the standard model, all we really need is for this to interact with this. So it's not a really big ask. I'll have to show how leptons and quarks can be built from, built up from these huddling ultimatons. Of course, if electrons and neutrinos and quarks are built up in this way from clusters of huddling ultimatons, then once again, our ideas about what's elementary will need to change. As it turns out, scientists have been wondering about this for some time, how elementary are elementary particles? But to find out, Boffins built a really big machine, the LHC. In 2012, the BBC made a documentary about what scientists hope to achieve with this machine. And here we've got a 40 second clip. In the summer of 2012, scientists at the LHC announced the discovery of the famous Higgs particle. It's the final piece of what's called the standard model. A set of 17 fundamental particles, including quarks and electrons, that make up everything we know. Elementary particles is a, is a myth, I think. Um, it looks at the moment as if quarks and electrons are point-like particles. We can't see any size to them, but that is just a, because we 
haven't been able to measure very short distances around them. What I'd like to see is what's going on inside them. So we're looking for the innards of the quarks by smashing them together as hard as we can. Okay, as you can see, scientists take this idea seriously about quarks being made up of structure. Uh, but there's a problem. If leptons and quarks are made from smaller parts, then the next natural level down is the so-called Planck scale, which implies inaccessible energies and lengths. So any such substructure would seem to be forever beyond human capacity to prove. But if something is beyond human capacity to prove, do those limitations of revelation apply? Is this why the authors are so free to say so much about ultimatons? That's, that's, that's the way I, approach I'm taking here. Okay, now, about this condensated charge, it's called weak hypercharge, and it's thought to fill all space. This is the famous Higgs-type field. This is why the LHC crashes together or oscillates. Uh, since the 1970s, we've required this sort of condensate, this we've assumed, in 2012, they claim to have proven that this field exists. But condensate of weak hypercharge, it's a mouthful. So Leonard Susskind likes to call this stuff zilch. <laughs> zilch. Uh, to hear Leonard talk about all this, there's a great Stanford video there where he explains all this really well. Uh, why does this matter? Well, think of a standard model particle, like a Z boson. It's the interaction of this sort of standard model particle with this standard model zilch that generates an interactive or standard model type of mass. Now by interaction, we mean something like this. A, a Z boson hooks onto a bit of zilch and lets it go. This is the Higgs mechanism. This is what got the Nobel Prize in 2013. Uh, Z bosons hooking into this condensate of zilch. Now we don't have a name for this mixture of Z boson plus zilch. But since it's so central to the Higgs mechanism, Susskind likes to call this quantum state a Ziggs. Yep, that's a Ziggs there. It's not a Higgs, that's something completely different. But here's the important bit. It's this flipping between states, between Z boson and Ziggs, that generates an interactive type of mass, exactly the type of mass we might associate with the Arantia book's interactive or linear type of gravity. And now that we have a Ziggs, the electron can get a mass. Yeah. Yeah. In the current standard model, the electron is thought of as spinning either left or right. And it's constantly flipping between these left and right hand states. And much like the Z boson, it's this flipping, this left right chiral oscillation that induces an interactive mass for the electron. But there's a problem. Uh, when an electron is spinning left, it has zilch. When it's spinning right, it has no zilch. But zilch is this weak hypercharge. It's a conserved quantity. So where does the zilch go? Once again, it's a condensate is involved. But this time, it's a condensate of these zilchy Ziggs particles. By hooking and releasing a Ziggs, the electron switches state from left to right. In other words, for an electron to switch states and thus get its interactive Higgs-type mass, it has to emit and absorb a particle that carries just the right quantum of zilch. Uh, now, but hang on, for 40 years we've been told that an electron is nothing but a fluctuation in a field. Doesn't this behavior seem a little bit fancy for a fluctuation? So to normal folks, this starts to look more like engineering than mere fluctuations in a field. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> it's, very, it's extraordinary, but this is the Higgs mechanism. Now, remember, to make contact with the standard model, I think we're getting up to that. Yeah, let's take a closer look at these huddling automatons. To make contact with the standard model, we want this to interact with this. Uh, now, for argument's sake, let's say that these primitive automatonic structures exist at the Planck scale. Uh, then notice what we have. We have something that's Planck-sized and quantized and spinning, which makes you wonder, is this where nature slips Planck's constant into physics? Is this how measurable energy gets locked, the quanta of finite action gets locked into space-time? As quanta of angular momentum bound up with huddling ultimatons. Okay, that's a convenient idea, but could nature really build standard model particles 
from such ultimatonic parts. Let's see how this might work. Imagine this basic building block to be some photon-like thing. Then imagine a simple cluster of such blocks. As some of you know, a standard model neutrino is modeled as a superposition of three primitive spinning things. Uh, so in a Uranus book scheme, a neutrino might be modeled something like this, as a superposition of clusters. Now, what are neutrinos famous for? Interacting with zilch. In fact, weak hypercharge, zilch is the only thing a neutrino can feel. So picture this as some chiral structure in that condensate of zilch. Uh, and what we have here is a standard model particle interacting with standard model zilch, but built from very non-standard parts. Uh, but there's more. As we know, a Higgs-type field is thought of as a space-filling condensate of primordial charge, which sounds a lot like space-filling condensate of primordial charge. In other words, segregata. Uh, the very stuff from which these primitive particles are made. So here's the question. Could segregata serve as this Higgs-type field that the standard model needs. At this point, let's remind ourselves why Higgs type field was invented. It was to give a quantum property called mass to standard model particles. Does the United Book say anything about the mass of particles? If we think of mass as response to gravity, then these papers describe two distinct types of response to gravity. The first is called absolute or a measure of absolute response to the source and center of gravity. It's this sort of mass that individual ultimatons are said to have. Uh, so for example, if our building block has three ultimatons and we build a tiny structure from three such blocks, we've got three times three, nine units of absolute response, ultimatonic response. But in the standard model, this tiny structure is interacting, oscillating, chiral, interacting with zilch. It's this interaction that induces a second type of mass, a second type of gravity and response, which the Arantia book calls linear. From paper 12, section 3, linear gravity is an interactive phenomenon. It's precisely this second type of mass, this linear or interactive response, that the Higgs mechanism was invented to explain. Right. So here's what seems to be the Arantia book story so far. From transcendental force organizers down to finite power directors, all the way down to frandelites and chronoldecks embedded in space and time, a condensated space potency is sequestered and quantized and made to huddle and then to interact with the condensate from which it came. The point is that if we're going to build standard model matter from ultimatons, we're going to need building blocks, something like this. Uh, it's just a bit further on. Okay, so uh, we have hypothetical building blocks. What about the electron? I think I might just pause for a second there, have a yeah. sip of water. I'm trying, it's all pre-recorded, so in the final version of this, I'll be, this will be a narration on top of the video. Look, does someone want to give me a, a moment's break and ask a question or a comment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ah. well, what's clear to me now is that the unqualified absolute has a name, and the name is Ziggy. <laughs> <laughs> and he played guitar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we've, we've now got those building blocks, uh, but the problem is that in these papers it says that the electrons are built from a hundred ultimatons. Okay. So how on earth are we going to get 100 ultimatons packed into a thing like an electron? Let's find out. Ah. In the current standard model, the so-called Dirac electron is modeled as a superposition of four whale fermions, or two pairs of two. Now, in a Urantia book scheme, we build these whale fermions, or four of them. We build these things from smaller parts, parts designed and tuned to interact with zilch. Ziggy. And we build these interactive parts from these Planck scale things, our huddling ultimatons. Uh, so now let's do the math. Uh, three, three times three times three times four gives us 108. 
Okay, so it's 108 tiny units of absolute response. If we allow a few of these clusters to share dipoles and tripoles, like atoms share electrons, then we can round this down to a nice even 100. And there we have it, the electron as ultimatonic engineering. Hmm. Of course, the issue here is that such mm. ultimatonic engineering implies design, and uh, this may be one step beyond where physics is quite ready to go. Nevertheless, does physics have, a, have room for a story like this? Let's see. Look, uh, here's Dirac's original 1928 equation, which we still use. Now, this equation tells us nothing about the electron. It simply helps us to predict with great <coughs> precision certain values that we can expect to measure, which leaves an awful lot of scope for speculation. Uh, so the standard view sees the electron as a point of charge. But this standard rule comes with a, a rule, the standard view has a rule, don't look too close. Uh, in this scheme, reality gets slippery. The electron becomes this pulse of probabilities interacting, entangled with virtual echoes of itself. It's very slippery. Don't try to picture that at home. So what if we do look really close? Well, then things get really, really weird. So weird that electrons must be more <coughs> than mere fluctuations. So what about a Planck scale string tangled up in 10-dimensional space? That's an alternative. Now, these two currently popular and incompatible schemes, one requires we complexify reality. The other, string theory, says complexify space. The Arantia book suggesting offering a third alternative. Complexify the particle. So in this scheme, the electron becomes a truly fabulous Planck scale machine. Now, remember how in paper 101, section 4, those limitations of revelation, they state that within a few short years, many of their statements regarding the physical sciences will stand in need of revision. <coughs> will stand in need of revision. Well, so far, we haven't attempted to revise the Arantia book story. With regard to the nature of mass and matter, and expressed in modern terms, this, or something like it, is that story. It turns out to be quite a tale. Look, I'll pause it there again. Right, so that's uh, what I've tried to do is to define, just expose those terms of gravita, ultimata, segregata, absoluta. How many readers have, have read that more than once in their 30 years of reading these papers? A lot of folks don't get turned on by force organizers unless you're sort of related to force organizers. Like, <laughs> I'm married to one. <laughs> you know, uh, some of us Frank Langs and Cronaldex have other views about this. Uh, so with those foundations, then directly, that implies certain implications about mass and matter. Now, the timing is great because if you think from 2012, 2015, this whole notion of a Higgs mechanism has been locked in. The theory was good, the LHC got some numbers, and they said, right, it seems to be going on. There's this condensator, this reservoir of energy out there, and it's the interactions between chiral particles, left and right flipping of these elementary particles, that is, is how we can ass assign a mass to these standard model particles. <coughs> Don't worry too much about the details, but uh, that video, Leonard Susskind, uh, the reason that video was so spectacularly good was he explained how this works. So if you've heard of an electron and a photon, then his 40-minute video explains exactly what this Higgs mechanism is doing. And he was around at the start, back in the 70s, when the standard model for particle physics was laid out, set in stone almost. He was there, he was one of those young... Uh, iconoclastic physicists with Weinberg and a couple of others who put this stuff in place and this Higgs mechanism had to be in the model. And it was just a theory, uh, but without that Higgs mechanism, this strange hooking into a condensate of zilch and letting these Higgs particles go, without that we haven't got a standard model. That's actually the starting point for standard model physics. It, it, it's as every bit as extraordinary as Ralph's 
nanomachines charging down my neurons. <laughs> I woke up in a cold sweat after that dream. <laughs> okay, uh, <clears throat> now... Uh, That's what makes it possible for you to speak so rapidly. <laughs> The speed of presentation is dictated by the speed of playback. So you can always play it back at half rate, if you like. All right, and it actually finishes in 42 minutes if we stick to the schedule. Uh, okay, so let's uh, see where we go next. All right, so so much for mass and matter. Let's now see what all this means for dark islands and for super universes. Uh, first, dark islands. Yep, dark islands. Now, my interest in Dark Islands was stirred by a comment from a long-time reader of the Arantia book. Like many of us, he started off quite impressed by their fabulous sci-fi cosmology, and for ten years he championed so-called Arantia book science. But over time, as his naive assumptions and misunderstandings got undermined, his interest in the scientific content cooled off, uh, prompting him to ask what he thought was a rhetorical question. Okay, so can you think of a novel so scientific proposal of the Arantia book that does not have a human origin? Can you think of something, anything, uh, unique to the book that we might await science to discover independently? Well, I can think of a few, but as a student of astrophysics, uh, I've become intrigued by one in particular. So I said, <coughs> here's one, that black holes can explode. This caught him by surprise. He thought he knew a thing or two about black holes. Uh, and that they might be related to dark islands. But as everybody knows, black holes do not explode. Uh, besides, where in the Arantia book does it talk about exploding dark islands? Uh, his scepticism was undented, but his curiosity was aroused. Let's uh, see what I mean about this. In 1915, Einstein presented his faint glimpse, the idea that one kind of gravity involves the curvature of a manifold in which particles and planets move. Naturally, Einstein assumed that this manifold must be space itself bound up with time. And so this idea of space-time was born. But the Arantia book upsets this simple view from paper 11, section 8. Quote, space is non-responsive to gravity. Hmm. If space is non-responsive to gravity, we have to wonder what's really being curved. We'll get back to that, but first, how did science test this new idea that gravity is related to curvature? I could have slowed down a bit there. Okay, one prediction of Einstein's theory was that the mass of a star should bend the path through space of light. This means that during a solar eclipse, the position of stars near the sun should seem to shift. In 1919, the shift was measured and found to match. It was this confirmation that forced scientists to take Einstein's weird idea seriously. But this idea about curvature has implications. As a star cools, it contracts. As it contracts, its density increases, uh, which would increase the local distortion of Einstein's space-time. So, for example, the path of a photon passing near a neutron star can be quite sharply bent. But if a cooling and contracting star has enough mass Something weird happens. It disappears. Uh, as the theory goes, if a contracting object shrinks below a certain size, its Schwarzschild radius, then an event horizon forms where the light gets trapped, uh, and the place where a star once was goes dark. In 1934, the author of the paper 15 referred to these as one type of dark island. In the 1960s, when mainstream science got interested, they were given the catchy name, Black Hole. Now, the standard model view of this collapse depends on two assumptions. One, that particles are nothing but fluctuations in a field and nothing can be infinitely compressed. And two, that since the manifold of space itself is being curved, all time-like geodesics must converge, the idea of a singularity. Now, the Arantia book story is different in two ways. First, regarding what happens when matter collapses, and second, regarding what's really being curved. As they say in paper 41, section 3, this process of cooling and contraction may continue, uh, but only so far. 
Notice that at a certain radius, an electromagnetic horizon can still form where escape velocity exceeds the speed of light. Uh, this is the idea behind the Arantia book Dark Island. Such an object would not reflect or emit light. It's the idea behind the Arantia book's Dark Island. But if space is non-responsive to gravity, the question is, what's really being curved? Now, the first thing to say, I'll just catch up with this. The first thing to say is that uh, we can't just ignore curvature because all the, the mechanism, the, all the mathematics of curvature works and it works really, really well. This is why it's been an accepted part of physics now, space-time being distorted by mass energy. So curvature works. Uh, yeah, where was I then? Uh, hang on a sec. Yeah, what's really being curved? Curvature works and it works very, very well. This is gravitational lensing. So an astronomer, we're all using gravitational lensing to measure things. So the whole idea of a gravitational lens is the bending of space, bending of space-time, the four-dimensional fabric. And this is the, the satellite navigation system. Uh. Sorry about that. OK, so again, satellite navigation, that all confirms the idea of uh, general relativity, space-time being bent. But Einstein discovers something else. Oh, this is Professor John Wheeler. Uh, right, remember the idea, space tells mass time how to curve, space time tells mass how to move. So that feedback between space and energy matter. But Einstein discovered also that E equals mc squared. This is his starting point. So when we say mass tells space time how to curve, we're really talking about energy and variations in the distribution of energy in space. Uh, and let's not forget that segregata is also called pure energy. So curvature works, but what's really being curved? Let's take a peek behind the curtain here. As you saw earlier, in the Arantia book scheme, everything we can measure is built from ultimatons. And ultimatons are condensed from segregata. But galaxies are embedded in a cloud of this same segregata. So it seems reasonable to expect some interaction between this uh, frozen segregata and this raw segregata. These are two, they're made from the same stuff. Water, ice, that sort of thing. And sure enough, when crossing through open space, particles of light are said to proceed in direct lines. But when plowing through this force blanket of segregata, these tiny bullets start to wave. Oh, and we, we measure them as waves. So notice what's just happened. Segregata has become a medium in which particles of light appear to wave. Uh, from paper 42, section 5, primordial force behavior, segregata, does give rise to phenomena analogous to your postulated ether. Analogous to your postulated ether, a medium in which particles of light appear to wave. For a scientist, this may be the most interesting line in the book. Now, notice something else. There's a lot of energy locked up in here, a lot of energy locked up in there. Uh, so, and segregata is also called pure energy. So this is replete with energy. But if pure energy or segregata can function as a medium in which particles of light appear to wave, uh, could it be that the local distribution of segregata, not space itself, is what energy mass can curve? That's worth repeating. Uh, is it the distribution of segregata, not space itself, that's really being curved by mass energy? <coughs> if, if absolutely the ultimate space is non-responsive to gravity, and if segregata serves as a medium in which particles of light appear to wave, what does this mean for Einstein's ideas about light and space and time? It means that the factors affecting a photon's path through space may only be faintly glimpsed in Einstein's relativity, as they say in paper uh, 195, section 7, and let not your dabblings with the faintly glimpsed findings of relativity, la di da but to me, this comment implies that Einstein's faint glimpse, his ideas about space and light and time, were a faint glimpse of something. But that something may be far more complex than Einstein assumed 
For example, uh, for example, this is a, a golden oldie from about 15 years ago. I made a little, this is that rotated Maltese cross from whatever paper that's in, Space Respiration. So what I want to imply with this is that where your basic simple original general relativity thought, well, there's going to be some sort of distortion of space, some curvature, what the Arantia book's implying is that the curvatures are not three-dimensional or four-dimensional. This is absolutely ultimate space. This is, this is something quite grander than space-time or the finite. Now, think of the master universe. This is the master universe model, just as a placeholder concept. And perhaps one day we can have a discussion about how many dimensions of space, how many space-like dimensions are involved in this Maltese cross, rotated Maltese cross. Because time's in there somewhere, and time doesn't exist. In this absinite, absolute perspective, uh, they don't bother with time. So this is a, this is a thing for exploring uh, next time. We won't, uh, give me a nice pause. All right, so what I'm, what I'm showing here, this 30 second glimpse. Here's a 30 second glimpse of some of the curvatures involved. There we go. This is that Maltese cross from paper 11, section 7. A few cycles of space respiration thrown in as well. That singularity we call paradise. Never paradise in there somewhere. Uh, as you can see, we need more than Einstein's relativity to accommodate this. Uh, here, space-time becomes a low-dimensional manifold in a more than finite space. That's to be continued, that one. So what does all this, all, all this mean for black holes and dark islands? Well, it means that certain standard model assumptions about particles and space and singularities ain't necessarily so. Eh. Uh, right. On, uh, so this is the standard model assumption. We've got a neutron star, right? So uh, we've got a collapse from a normal star down, a big star, to a neutron star, and gravity wins. So we've got further collapse. Uh, there's nothing in the standard model to stop the collapse. So all these time, this is space-time being bent here. That's the event horizon, so that's sort of the Schwarzschild radius there. And there's nothing to stop the total collapse to a singularity in the standard model. There's no structure to their elementary particles. So uh, as the theory goes, there's nothing, there's no alternative but for a singularity to form. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is that some of these assumptions ain't necessarily so. On the other hand, if this process of cooling and contraction can be stopped, allowing dark islands to form, then we face a question. How does nature stop the collapse of a collapsing neutron star? Well, the Urantia book adds something that can do the job, something that we might think of as the mother of all exclusion principles. Uh, let's take a closer look at this process of cooling and contraction. Okay? So, after a normal star like our sun burns up its fuel, it starts to cool and contract. But normal stars can cool and contract only so far. Uh, they end up as white dwarfs. What happens is that as this ball of gas starts to cool, gravity squashes the atoms closer together, and the star begins to shrink. And as it cools some more, then the electrons are forced closer to the protons, and the atoms themselves start to shrink. At this point, a quantum uh, exclusion principle kicks in and stops the collapse, holds up the white dwarf stable. And in paper 41, it's called electronic condensation, this process. The idea is that basic material units are being brought closer and closer together. That squashed atom over there. Now, it's worth pausing to consider what just happened. You know, this is just worth reflecting on. Something the size of our sun has been squashed into the volume the size of the Earth. So you, we've all seen a bit of, you know, Astronomy, you know stars are big and the little tiny rocky planets are small. Well, a white dwarf 
They're about the size of the Earth. This is sort of a you know, 6,000, 7,000 kilometer radius. So a normal star, when it collapses down to a white dwarf, that's, that's what's going on. Uh, something the size of the Sun has collapsed down to something the size of the Earth. Okay, so what happens if we add a little extra mass? If we feed in a bit of extra mass to this cooling and contracting ball, what can we expect to have happen? Anticipation. <laughs> if we add a little more mass, then from paper 41, this process of cooling and contraction may continue. If a dying star weighs more than about 1.4 times the mass of our Sun, then gravity wins. Gravity overwhelms that electron degeneracy pressure and squashes this mass of atoms into a ball of neutrons only 10 kilometers across. That's a, a neutron star. Once again, these, we have the basic units of matter being brought closer and closer together. Uh, again, the process is stopped by a exclusion principle. Uh, this time, it's, it's neutron degeneracy pressure, and that provides the stability to stop the collapse. So you didn't get a stable thing, these neutron stars. Okay, so so far, so good. But just, just keep in mind what's happened. The white dwarf is what you get when the entire mass of our sun gets squashed into the volume the size of the Earth, and a neutron star is what you get if you squash even more mass into the volume the size of a small city. These are completely <coughs> outlandish. There are people out there that don't believe in neutron stars. They say, this can't work. But mainstream astrophysics, you've got, this is what you've got. And it is, when you look at it closely, it is, it's exhilarating, it's outrageous, it's extraordinary. But that is the size of a city. 1.4 to 2 solar masses worth of mass and matter squashed in to a ball of neutrons. Okay, again, things are being brought closer and closer together. Where we're going with this is that we're going to start bringing the automatons closer together. And there's that mother of all exclusion principles lurking in the background. All right, this brings us to the cutting edge of physics. Which brings us to the cutting edge of physics. I can have a sip of water. I might have been supposed to say something there. Anyway, uh, now... Okay. I'm going to try and resynchronize with my, my script there. Now, our standard models can handle neutron stars. Uh, they're just a bunch of neutrons packed very, very tight. But if we add a little extra mass, then gravity wins again, and these neutrons start to melt. What happens is that the core temperature in a neutron star is thought to jump over a billion. They talk about trillions of degrees. So all bets are off when these neutrons start to melt. The temperatures go through the roof, and uh, this is where the standard model starts to fail. The quantum field theory has no mechanism to, to stop the collapse, so it predicts infinite density as all these, these particles, these quantum fluctuations, get infinitely compressed. There we go. Okay. And the way cosmology measures space, the metric simply fails. So we get this business of black holes and singularities and infinite density. Uh, but the Urantia book implies something else. Uh, the collapse of a collapsing neutron star can be stopped, allowing a dark island to form. Now, since this collapse depends on gravity and mass, let's take a closer look at what happens when these neutrons start to melt. In the standard view, a neutron is a robust little bag that contains three quarks. The mass of such a bag is about 939 million electron volts divided by c squared. Let's call that 939 units of standard model mass. But the mass that these particles get from, or the quarks get from the Higgs mechanism, is tiny. It's only about 10 of these units of mass. That's only 1% of the neutron's measured mass. So where does all this mass come from? It's thought to come from two things. 
the momentum of these quarks as they rush around and a weird type of glue that keeps the quarks together. When we add up all of the energies involved in these momentums and glue, we get that 939 units of standard model mass. It's this weird nuclear superglue that induces a thing called quark confinement. As the velocity of the quarks pull them apart, the more glue appears and pulls them back together, like an unbreakable rubber band. But the standard model has uh, another surprise called uh, asymptotic freedom. It's got the Nobel Prize 2004. When a neutron's quarks are close together, there's no need for all that glue. Uh, so that cloud of virtual gluons disappears. And so think what this means if local linear gravity can replace the need for gluons to confine the quarks. In other words, let gravity confine the quarks instead of glue. Uh, but then all that interactive mass from the self-interactions of the gluons, that disappears. And as the range for the quarks to move around becomes constrained, so too their momentum disappears. OK, so if the momentum and the gluons disappear, what's happened to the mass of this tiny compacting ball? That's a good question. Uh, and as this process of cooling and contraction continues, what's going on inside? Well, in the Urantia book story, this tiny structure would still be filled with those clusters of huddling automatons. And remember, it's these clusters that interact with the zilch, the Higgs flipping left and right. So here's the thing to think about. If these tiny structures melt, this last level of structure, if they melt, there'd be nothing for a Higgs mechanism to flip. No left-right particles to change, meaning all that interactive mass is gone. Uh, which raises the question, as this cooling and contracting ball approaches the limiting and critical explosion point of ultimatonic condensation, if all the so-called interactive or linear mass is gone, how much does such an object weigh? And if no linear mass means no linear gravity, what local force is left to confine the agitated absinite attributes of these ultimatons? Remember, in the Arantia book story, Ultimatons are not mere abstract fluctuations. They are a condensate of a condensate of space potency. These are real contenders. And don't, let's, don't forget this ultimatonic exclusion principle. Uh, the idea is that if ever these absinite attributes of these ultimatons uh, start to overlap, this extreme repulsion kicks in, this mother of all exclusion principles to stop the collapse. Meaning that this process of cooling and contraction may continue, but only until this ultimatonic exclusion principle stops the collapse. But that's not the end of the story. Quote, this process of cooling and contraction may continue to the limiting and critical explosion point of ultimatonic condensation. Now, how many ways can we read limiting critical explosion? This ball explodes. Imagine 20 solar mass dark island, 20 solar masses worth of E equals mc squared, released in a moment. Released in a moment. As I read this paragraph, as this limiting and critical explosion point is reached, dark islands become nature's most efficient bomb. But what sort of bomb? If this ultimatonic explosion begins as a release of unbound ultimatons, then initially there'd be no electrons in the mix, so uh, no electromagnetic light. So the actual initial explosion may be dark, invisible. Of course, there'd be, uh, as the commotion settles down, there'd be electromagnetic effects, like perhaps a gamma ray burst, uh, followed by some electromagnetic afterglow. Now, we've spotted this type of bomb going off ever since we put uh, gamma ray detectors in space, and they remain a mystery. Uh, this is a snapshot of the first 500 uh, gamma ray bursts detected by NASA's Swift Observatory up to about 2010. The, the new picture is just completely covered with dots. Uh, one explanation for the short period type of gamma ray burst is the birth of a black hole. But do they really mark the death of a dark island? And if so, what a neat technique for recycling dead stars. 
<laughs> As we've seen, the Ranch book tells quite a tale about mass and matter and dark islands that go boom. Uh, central to this story are new foundations for the vast reservoirs of energy and mass that science currently can measure but can't explain. In the upcoming movie, before I... Uh, in the upcoming movie, I'll explore what all this means for... This is the first half. The next half will be about what this might mean for super-universes. If you think of standard model, mass, standard model matter, or can only appear really in a disk of ultimata, which can only appear in a halo of segregata, then what's this implying about the grand universe, the super universe space level? And what role did Nether Paradise play in getting the whole show on the road? The case I'm going to be making is that Nether Paradise is the mother of all force organizers. They learnt their craft by watching how they do it in paradise. And thus we go into the outer space. But look, I think that's quite enough for now. Uh, that was an exercise to get this in place, to just expose readers and those watching you know, in the future to the phenomenon implied by these uh, almost unexplored concepts of segregata, ultimata, gravita, and how it links into standard model physics. Uh, and for me, it's been a, a, a lot of fun I can see all these connections which bring this together uh, and it's the, the LHC, the web telescope, all this sort of stuff. The next 10 years, as the data gets much clearer, sharper, better, uh, they're going to be looking for, you know, the question that physicists often ask is, is a theory crazy enough to be true? Mm -hmm. We've done all the simple things, you know, you can see electrons, right, you can see protons, you can see quarks, okay. Easy stuff has been done. The problem is, where do we go next? Everything beyond the current standard model of particle physics is too small to, to measure. The energies involved to look that small are too high. So there is a possibility we won't be able to see ever um, inside a quark, as that guy that was Professor Andrew, someone, someone from, who designed the, one of the experiments at the LHC. And they were hoping to see inside quarks, because they all know that Higgs field was there. That wasn't a surprise. That was all assumed and expected. But what these guys who design these machines are looking for is how we break this standard model. Because, you know, we, we don't want to just be stamp collecting for the next, you know, the rest of time. We want to break the model and see how things are put together. Now, no one is going to come up with this sort of model. Oh, they tried in the 70s and 80s. Back in the 80s, they, they began to explore prion models, which are a bit like, they're a very simplified version of this. But they, they were trying to, trying to make particles from three primitive particles, or you know, three by three, and of course they couldn't get it to work. Once you're at that size, and the energies implied are, are monstrous, they're off the scale. So what we need is some way to lock the energies together. And this is why, you know, this idea of <coughs> That sort of that Leonard Jeans type of potential where you get this uh, huddling, you've got a repulsion and an attraction, it means there's this little place, like Lagrange points for uh, cosmology, astrophysics, where automatons, these little interactive particles, can huddle, literally lock themselves together. So that's the sort of thing. Uh, don't worry too much that I went so fast and just zoomed through it all. This was an exercise. This is the stepping stone to put it together into a, you know, a, a, a digestible summary. Because as you can see, the, the ideas are pretty simple. There's nothing terribly complex. It's like Einstein just said, look, pretend the speed of light is the same in all reference frames. These foundational concepts don't need to be complicated. The, the mathematics is just bizarre, but the ideas can be pretty simple. So what I've tried to throw up there is a simple, the simplest possible ultimatonic model which really is almost within reach of contacting the standard model of particle physics. Well, let's call a halt to that there, okay? <laughs> Thank you for putting up with all that. Uh, all right. So, uh, hopefully you've got some rude comments or some <laughs> exhilarating <laughs> feedback.
Uh, we've got some time, so let's do some Q&A. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Could you describe Zilch in a little bit more detail? I'm not quite sure I did. Yeah, the, the problem with the whole Higgs mechanism was that the mathematics involved, yet when you do, when you go into it through the tertiary stream, postgraduate work, all you see is the mathematics, and the mathematics is completely opaque. You just run the numbers. You run the equations, and it'll give you numbers. So this is, this is what they did with the LHC. They, they got their detectors and they, they detected what, they, you know, what was coming out of these explosions and they matched it up with what theory was going to be predicted. So the reason I pointed to Susskind and uh, threw in that the zilch word and the Ziggs particle is because uh, he's, he's wrestled with how to explain this you know, since 1974. When they propose this standard model, which requires the Higgs mechanism, which is this left-right, it's this oscillation, zilch, weak hypercharge. Zilch is the, the weak force. You've got electromagnetism uses photons, right? That's one kettle of fish, one domain of interaction. Electrons, electricity, photons. At a far smaller scale, you've got the weak force. The weak force is what flips quarks between left, you know, up and down quarks, this sort of thing. It's, it's to do with changing the nature of your quarks, this weak hypercharge. Famously, in the old days, they would say, oh, it's responsible for beta decay because the neutron is breaking down because the, the quark is changing. And the quark is changing because of interactions with weak hypercharge. And because it's a condensate of weak hypercharge is that long, long phrase, so he's trying to just, when talking about it, say, well, let's call this zilch. It's this stuff which is the foundation for standard model physics. It has to be there if, it's, if we take this out, weak hypercharge, and this chiral oscillation, left-right, chiral is left-right. If we take that out, we haven't got a standard model. So in that little video, if you perhaps saw, well, the link is around, you search for Susskind. It was demystifying the Higgs boson after 2012. Independence Day 2012, he was invited to try and explain, you know, what did they find? What is this Higgs thing, this Higgs mechanism? What's the boson? And so this guy, the, the, sort of the grandfather of both the standard model and string theory, like he's a string theorist until you know, he finds better data, uh, he's, he's worked out this beautiful way to present the whole idea. And uh, the, the way that made, to remove the mathematics and just say weak hypercharge, he's got this little picture of electrons flipping left and right in this background of a Higgs field. The Higgs field is weak hypercharge. So this is a, it's, in a, it's, a, it's a reservoir of energy. This is just this assume it's emerged from God knows where. But this Higgs field uh, emerged uh, after inflation in the Big Bang model, right? They said, well, we need, we need a Higgs field, we need, you know, isotropic homogeneous, so we need inflation, we need a Higgs field, but the energy <coughs> implied by this Higgs field, it, you know, it's just, standard model stuff is low energy, it's, it's dilute and it's uh, friendly, touchy-feely stuff, but a Higgs field, the energies involved are astronomical. And there's a famous mismatch between cosmology and particle physics. The reason why those two standard models don't fit together is because uh, particle physics is replete with energy. The energy density in the domain of particle physics is, uh, they talk about being 10 to the 120 times more energy than cosmology can accommodate. You know, if you can have gravity pulling <coughs> galaxies around, uh, you've got to have empty space, says cosmology. But particle physics says it's filled with energy. A Higgs field is pervasive, and the energy locked up in that emerged, emerged field uh, is, we need it to make the standard model work, but cos it doesn't fit in with cosmology. Uh, so plenty of scope for a young, young postgraduate to dive into this on the web, if anyone's interested in <laughs> doing the mathematics. So, yeah. Yeah, if I can, if we can, we can calculate it. It says that there's a hundred 
Um, Can you speak a little louder? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Margie Ray. And there's a hundred um, ultimatons to make an electron. Can you calculate how many ultimatons are in a boson? Is that a, is that a legitimate calculation? I mean, well, a boson is a particle. Right. I understand that. So we're going to say we're going to build particles. That whole hierarchy, the zoo of particles. The, the idea here is that we're going to build them out of these little primitive clusters. Right. So the way that you actually lock energy, lock this stuff, you know, segregata, ultimata, ultimatons, mm -hmm. uh, you've got to somehow contain this, it's not finite, these are borderland, absolute, finite phenomena. You think of, they're transcendental force organizers, they're e prim eventuated and transcendental. And then they talk about uh, the segregata ultimata, there's nothing finite about this. There's a, 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 an interface, a borderland realm uh, represented by ultimatons. And somehow they have to be locked into what we're calling space-time, or what Lisa Randall, she's got, she's got, the mathematics is ready to go for this sort of brain world scenario, where things are locked onto a membrane of creation, or a low-dimensional membrane in a high-dimensional background. Uh, that's now a, a respectable branch of science brain world cosmology. But what, we, what we're implying here is that by letting these things, the mutual attraction and this huddling proclivity somehow locks up those absolute attributes into this little huddling package. They're all spinning, you know, this is beyond light speed and all that sort of stuff. They're not really finite in some sense. But by locking them together, you've got a, a primitive structure. And from those, you can start to then you know, get the engineering to work. And, but how you, how you assemble your clusters is going to give you, like that little package of nine could be the neutrino. The, for those that don't know, a neutrino is, is one of the most loved and mysterious and uh, tricky things to, to model in the, in the standard model because uh, it doesn't interact with anything. As we speak, you've got this whole room. We're living in a neutrino ocean. And what I implied in that one of those slides was that uh, there are three types of these hypothetical neutrinos and uh, if you measure a neutrino it's going to be this mixture, superposition of these three types. So uh, superpositions, quantum winds, entanglement, all of that sort of stuff fits in very well with these not quite finite clusters, huddling ultimatons, being bound up and interacting with this, this manifold that we can measure. If photons are locked onto this manifold. This is part of the idea of the brain world. The things we can measure are locked onto our space-time. So that whatever space-time does, they can only move in that space-time. But then gravity, perhaps uh, ultimatons, aren't locked onto. So part of this ultimatonic scheme would be locking these things into our measurable domain. Can I ask Sorry. Yeah. Anybody else? Bob. My name is Bob Salone. Uh, do, you, do you have an idea of uh, what our scientists are going to have to discover to overturn the standard Big Bang theory and that the universe is only 13.7 billion years old? Or, the, the, the and the space res respiration as opposed to expanding the universe? George Park was going to talk all about this originally. He was going to introduce this whole thing. He was going to set cosmology in place. That was going to be the first lecture this morning. But of course, he couldn't come. Uh, so the simplest way to sort out a big bang is to remove redshift. Because what we have is not so much cosmology, but a, a measurement of redshifts. All we have, the only measurement of the quasars, and the size, and the expansion, and the cosmic microwave background, is, is a tabulation of redshift data. So once we start to, uh, if segregata, if a photon passing through a cloud of a galaxy, the halo around a galaxy of segregata, and they're going like little bullets out in what's the um, what's the original space potency, right? So you've got the galaxies with their cloud of ultimata segregata, and in between it's still space potency, whatever that is. And that's not that's not nothing finite about that. It's a pre-reality they call it. So what these papers are saying is that as these photons move through that, they're moving like particles, like bullets. But when they bump into segregata, a, a galaxy, say, then the nature of a photon is changing. 
instead of being wave particle confusion, it becomes, it, it, it's affected by the segregator it's moving through. So that's why I'm, I'm making a case that uh, what's, uh, what's actually curved with gravitational lensing and the, the whole distortions of Einstein's initial simplified relativity is that that could actually not be, perhaps not space-time, but distortions to segregata. Now, if a photon starts to wiggle when it bumps into segregata, what's that down to its frequency? So in a, very, in a couple of, oh, and of course, force organizers, right? A quasar is a quasar because it's got a high redshift. That's the only th reason why it's made that's a quasar is because it's got a redshift of four or five or something like that. Uh, that implies it's a long way away. But if it was the space-time disturbance of a force organizer exiting stage right from this disk, then what is the effect of a, force, a transcendental force organizer on the local space-time? And that's the frequency of a photon. Okay. So I, I like to mention, that Dick Bream, I like to make a comment about the 13.7 billion mm -hmm. year Big Bang, because the, the study that we talked about uh, last year, um, I thought the Big Bang theory got shot down, mm -hmm. and that was from, well, I'm not sure which it was, a Planck satellite and another one, and when they launched that second satellite, the data was supposed to match, and because the data didn't match, uh, physicists had a real issue with that. And um, so it kind of shot down the Big Bang Theory, but then uh, when you continue reading the article, there was an explanation from uh, some Canadian physicists and some Chinese physicists that said that, wait a minute, the data from these two satellites would agree if space had a bounce back. So it would stop and then bounce back. So. It, it seems to me that that, ex that data from last year, and, and I thought that was so exciting because I thought that was the first time they really shot down Big Bang Theory, but, you know, it seems like that has, you know, you know what I'm talking about, that yeah. one article. Yeah, the Big, the, Big Bang, the Big Bang Theory has died a number of times. <laughs> <laughs> it really completely died in the early 80s, and then they found this, this the background it was that particular black body curve was the only reason the, the uh, Big Bang cosmology you know, got over the hump. They readjusted re the parameters and said, well, look, ah, there it is, that's what we're looking for. Uh, and then inflation was a problem because well, how can the temperature of that side of the universe be the same as that side of the universe? And they, they whacked in inflation because that solves the problem of how you can have, that's magic. If, ever you, if you, want, you want emergent magic or inflation is the, yeah. is the poster child for magic. But it solves the problem. It, it made cold, dark matter, big bang, land cosmology work. Because it keeps, it keeps failing when the better data comes in, new satellites, better data. Then you find all these incongruities and anomalies which have to be explained. And that's what the scientific method does. It looks at the problem and says, well, look, ah, someone will find a way to explain it. A young person keen to break the model or to, you know, point out why the model still works. And that's where the Big Bang's up to. Uh, it's being held together by, you know, brilliant mathematics and brilliant data. But eventually, you know, the thing, next year when Webb goes up, uh, the Webb Space Telescope, you know, that's going to reveal a whole new domain of, of precision. You know, the, the, the data from that will uh, shake up who knows what. Mm. Sorry. Phil. Um, Phil Calabrese. <laughs> Phil Calabrese, yes. Um, there's so many questions. I, I'll, I'll try to focus on one to start with. Anyway, the ranch book says that all matter is configured on the order of the solar system, and uh, therefore the ultimate time, too. It also says that the ultimate time has a nucleus paradise. Um, and I wanted to relate that to what we were talking about earlier. God is the first source and center. And that's a present center. 
of everything. So our concepts have to allow paradise to be at the center of every automaton, not just the center of, in a macroscopic sense, but in a microscopic sense, I maintain. So, I mean, you haven't talked about the internal structure of an ultimate time. You, you know, they're, they're little balls. Um, so you might, I don't know if you want to get into that a little bit. Another thought before I lose the floor is <laughs> related to what you were saying about the Big Bang. And we have the statement in, in your Rancher book they don't make statements, specific statements, very clear statements without, you know, being right. That Andromeda, the light from Andromeda, paused to consider. It took almost one million years. Now we're saying in contemporary science it's more like 2.5. And it seems to me that if we're vibrating matter, with segregata, and I like that idea, in terms, instead of, you know, we're, we're distorting the segregata, then if the, the photons are going through segregata, does that slow them down? Or, or the does frequency? it just change the frequency, and then we're saying, oh, well, it reduced the, the uh, frequency and it made the wavelength go red, and so we're saying, well, uh, it must be two and a half times farther away than, than we thought. So, I mean, those are two thoughts um, that you might want to comment on. Oh, look, uh, once you introduce this stuff, Segregata, Ultimato, Gravita, all bets are off because uh, everything's changed. So, as we work through this, uh, we're going to have to have to think broadly and brilliantly, and you know, in new ways. Unexpected thinking. Because uh, remember, the old idea of special relativity, that whole thing unfolded from the idea of riding a, light, uh, riding a photon. If you're sitting on a photon, what would you see? What would reality be like if you were a photon, or riding a photon? So by starting that train of thought, special relativity, modern physics unfolded. So if we're going to say, well, ultimate times are there, whatever they are, however we're going to depict them or model them, uh, computer models, then once you've got them, uh, then, well, everything's changed. So our job, if we want to, you know, go, go do the next thing, is to start building mathematical models and see what they predict, see if we can synchronize them with what we can measure. So, Will, you've got to, I, I'm very familiar with your ideas and your model. And I'm, uh, you know, we can have dueling models mm. over the next ten years. Mm. May the best model win. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and the, regarding paradise, the, uh, the paragraph about the the nucleus of an of an ultimaton. Mm -hmm. In George's paper, George was uh, was talking about literally the location of nether paradise and how it's sort of something coming from below nether paradise and all of that. But keep in mind that paradise isn't in our measurable manifold. The space-time that photons move through isn't connected with paradise. It's not in the same domain. Uh, and it's not finite, whereas we're in a finite manifold. So that's, that throws out a big question. How do you conceive of absolutely ultimate space uh, in relation to space-time, a finite measurable thing where photons you know, take one light second to go one light second? Uh, when, when Jesus was talking about this in, on the way to Rome and Carthage with the Mithraic priest, talking about time and space. He wasn't talking about personality or dimension, um, um, other things. He was talking about the nature of space and time. And he said, eventually, you know, whether mortals will uh, find that, discover themselves in a seven-dimensional space. That was in the paragraph about space and time. T 
to me, you know, I've been living in, multi, in an n-dimensional models for a long, long time, so it's not a, not a big leap to think of the finite in motion relative to a higher dimensional background, an absinite master universe background, where old-fashioned ideas about time and dimension, simply, we're going to have to let them fall away in some sense. Oh, God, yeah. So, uh, Gar Jameson, and uh, I come from the, the physics of the, of the mystics. And so, uh, I've always been fascinated by Catherine of Siena, who suggested that the journey to paradise is through paradise. And Jesus' idea that the kingdom is already here uh, and the suggestion that paradise has location, but it's not in space-time, it's not measurable. The suggestion from Catherine, in my opinion, is that we're already here. If that's, that's one piece. And then the other piece comes from that great physicist, Meister Eckhart, who suggests that God is a circle whose center is everywhere, but circumference is nowhere. Well, that's very close to the idea of the quiescent zones. The quiescent zones are inside paradise, effectively. Somehow, it's the geographic extension of the Isle of Paradise uh, encloses these quiescent zones. So, so essentially, we're, we're inside the whole structure. So what does this mean about a center? What is paradise, the physical source and center? And if we're not limited to three dimensions, then when, when we say a nucleus, I've always interpreted that paradise is the nucleus of the ultimaton as a double entendre. That this idea that in some sense, in some high dimensional sense, left, right, or somewhere off axis, there is a direct connection with paradise. But when you think about, when, in the context where they're talking about that, they're talking about these clouds of ultimata unassociated automatons according to this great space drift orbiting this, this vast, you know, over there is the center, the source and center, but they're in the space drift around. So that nucleus is what this drift is, is centered on. So that's a, a distal spatial extent. So but that, with the double entendre of nucleus, a local nucleus with a distant rotational center, orbital center, uh, that's a rich, rich statement, that one. Nucleus of, of the ultimate time? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be talking about that for years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dave? Hey, you know, I'm Dick Brandt. Oh, Dick, and sorry. So I, I still want to make a comment on that because we, we've discussed the nucleus being, uh, uh, paradise being the nucleus of the ultimate time in our study groups. And, it, it, and I thought that was just very fascinating. Um, so the way I view it, is since, since we know the, there's a hundred ultimatons in the electron, and the, the Arrangia book talks about how the, they don't, they're not in orbits, they just cluster, but the axes are all lined up. So how do we not know that all of the axes are really just lined up to paradise? So paradise being very far away, okay, um, is still the nucleus, but it doesn't matter where the matter is, electrons or whatever, that the axis of all of those ultimatons, whether in this super universe or that super universe, are always facing towards paradise. Uh, Phil Calibri, again. Well, I've always asked myself how, what holds the, the ultimaton together? Isn't it paradise gravity? So, um, you know, if the ultimate town has, is spatially, uh, is not a point, it has extension in space, what holds it together? It's also spinning, like mad. So, I think it has to be held together by paradise within, the center of all things. I don't see how it can be, oh, <coughs> ultimate town's over here, and paradise is over there, and the ultimate time's orbiting, which is usually the word when you think of a, a, a small, smaller body orbiting, but we have spin for the rotation of a particle on its own axis. And that's what I'm saying. You'd have, I don't see any other way to hold the ultimate time together except by 
Well, maybe you have a way to do it with segregata. Um, what would hold the automaton together? Well, it's, think of the vortices in liquid helium. Once you get a vortex in liquid helium, it can't stop. It's super fluid. And the, the, the definition is that if you get a little beaker of liquid hydrogen, liquid helium, uh, and put a bit of angular momentum into it, it quantizes. It can have not less than a quantum of angular momentum. And so they will keep going forever, those little vortices in liquid helium. And so the, the idea is analogous. I was going to you know, go into all of that. But what, what the impl implication is that what we want to do is somehow to quantize a set an, an automaton, because they're, they're discrete. So somehow we need to quantize this thing, but it needs to be related to segregata. So very, this is just the very simplest way of doing it. Don't worry about you know internal parts. It's just this it's a quantized vortex. So it's like pressure from segregata? This, this is what the, remember, this is what the associate force organizers do. They quantize segregata. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rob. OK. I think we're getting very close to running out of time. A yeah. uh, couple of last questions, comments? Paul. Paul Anderson. Um, I'm not a scientist, but what comes to mind with all this is that, in reality, matter and spirit are one in paradise, really. It's not that much different. The father fragments himself. Why can't paradise fragment itself into ultimate tones? Into ultimate tones. And be fragments, be paradise fragments. Thanks, Paul. Well, keep in mind there are four sources and centers. There's the three and the trinity, and then there's the paradise source and center. And one of these great revelatory uh, concepts in these papers is that each of those sources and centers is the source and center for their own domain of action, their own gravity circuit, their own level of reality. So what that's implying, or what is always implied to me, is that your spirit gravity, your spirit source and center, is completely distinct from your paradise and your material source and center. So we don't have a gradation like the old the sort of theosophical idea of finer and finer versions of the absolute original stuff, mm -hmm. heavenly stuff, when it becomes crude and coarse becomes matter. These papers are describing something something different than that. And they needed a, a, four distinct sources and centers to make it work. God. Gar Jameson, is there anything in paper 41 and 42 that keeps you up at night, that disturbs you, that causes you to wonder about what you've just presented? Gravity pulling at right angles. Because <laughs> if you've got seven dimensional space, where is your right angle? <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, let's eat. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>